Thank you, friends. Uh, difficult to talk to an audience which has just been seeing how we take out the knees and put in new ones. But my talk is actually about knee preservation. You have, oh, old fashioned. You don't have a, tell a ticket. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about knee preservation and going to be discussing things like PRP in knee osteoarthritis. You know, we've been, we've been looking at knees like this all morning, and we know that these knees have straightforward solutions. The obvious solution is an arthroplasty. But the issues come back because of many other things. Since the time Hunter said that once you have ulcerated cartilage, this cannot be repaired, it's still true. But the problem is osteoarthritis is definitely cartilage loss, limited cartilage regeneration, and also our understanding of what actually may stimulate healing. So this is an issue which we want to look, but modern medicine in this century looks and allows us to think possibility of salvaging some of these knees in early osteoarthritis. The problem is the definition. What is early osteoarthritis? When should you be doing some intervention? It may be too early or it may be too late for the preservation intervention you want to do. And the second problem comes up is our own understanding of how osteoarthritis progresses. We are not so sure of what all the, what are the different stages where we could influence them with non-surgical issues. And of course, the third problem is the comorbidities. You don't look at the knee alone, you look at the patient as a whole, you look at its genetic predisposition, their habits, their obesity, everything comes into play. And we have the biggest problem about decisions. What is it that we want to do in early osteoarthritis? Do you want to treat the pain, the disability, improve the function, or if possible, try to attempt some healing? In the 21st century, the trends are towards personalizing treatment. You just saw Anoop trying to personalize the knee implant. And that's what things are happening in this century, that we are looking at a person, looking at his knee, and seeing what exactly can we do for that knee. Maybe we can modify the disease. And this perhaps could be possible because we are now looking not at implants, but at the biology. Could we influence the biological processes inside the knee and maybe to some extent, if not heal the cartilage, retard its degeneration? The new thought process today, therefore, is joint preservation. And this is what I'm going to talk about in the next five or six minutes. This common sense approach is called as orthobiologics. And this is indicated both in trauma, orthopedics, and in other kinds of arthritic conditions, but with some sense. That's why I said the issue is a common sense approach. And in this orthobiologics, a lot of work has been focused on PRP. At PGI, we've been working on this now for about nine years, and we've been talking about it wide and far. This year, I published a meta-analysis with Freddie Fu and Mohit Bhandari, and the literature supports the fact that PRP has significant improvement on pain in orthopedic surgery. And we can take it forward, and we started using PRP to stimulate tissue healing. We have started doing it in the elbows, in the heel, in, in, even in the knee. And the biggest work we have over there is PRP in the knees, which we started as early as 2009. We feel that PRP helps in repairing the joint. And what do I mean by this? How do I mean by repairing the joint? Because when you inject platelets, they are a source of a lot of growth factors. And these growth factors induce so many things. They have an anti-inflammatory effect on the synovium. They have a stimulating effect on some of the cartilage cells. And they could have chemotactic and mitogenic effect on the MSCs also. Now these platelets need to be activated to release the growth platelets, growth factors from their alpha granules. And the rationale is very simple. In a knee going bad, there is a mismatch between the breakdown products 
and the healing processes. And this is a serious imbalance in osteoarthritis. And these growth factors may help to reduce this imbalance inside the knee. So what does the literature say? In the last 20 years, there have been hundreds and hundreds of publications on knee osteoarthritis, hip, and even now some on the ankle. And if you look at the PubMed, you will actually find volumes of literature focused only on PRP in knee osteoarthritis. Experimental medicine is significant. It was the first time in 2009 that they found that PRP actually stimulated chondrocyte gags and suppressed OA progression in, in rabbits. We have done it in PGI, three to four uh, research projects in guinea pigs, and it's the same. And this was our public study in 2013. And this was the first randomized controlled trial in the world where we found that PRP seems to help osteoarthritic knees. We also worked with Alan Mishra and Nicola Mufuli, and there is now a, a sort of a, a classification of what platelet rich plasma types should be. And I'm not going to go into the details, but just let you know that if you use PRP inside the knee, you may get better outcomes by taking out the leukocytes because they have an inflammatory effect which you do not want inside the knee. We published some of our experimental work from here that repeated serial injections may not be once every three weeks, maybe once every few months, may be helpful. And the similar work has been proven clinically from Spain, where they have said that repeated serial injections over a period of years or months may be that much more better. And if you look at other comorbid factors which you could control potentially. We also starting improvising, not just giving a simple injection of PRP every four weeks, three weeks, or maybe every six months, but we are now looking at different things. The concept which we've introduced is known as a superdose PRP, which we've done in some cases. Because we use our own blood bank, not the commercial machines, we are able to get lots of volume. So eight ml instead of four ml, and this, each one of them centrifuged doubly to get a higher platelet count seems to have better outcomes. We have been trying to combine PRP with carriers. PRP, if you put into the joint, the half-life or the working life ends in eight to 10 days because the granules go away. But if you add it to something, like this hydrogel, which was added by some of the Japanese authors, and Chitosan PRP, which we've been using in experimental situations, the life of these platelets and the degree of excretion of these uh, granules could go on increasing over time. You can combine PRP with other procedures. Things like microfracture plus PRP have been known to improve outcomes in early osteoarthritis. But we must also know what can go wrong. So whether it is risky, what are the safety things, this is what the medical fraternity needs to know. But there is no doubt that the safety of PRP, your own PRP, has been well established. And let me tell you, even we have been starting using allogenic PRP in our guinea pig experiment since the last four years. You can combine it with hyaluronic acid also. And there are studies which show that it is good, although we have not done it. But what is happening outside PRP for knee preservation is that people are looking at percutaneous fat transfers. People are also looking at some kind of degeneration when you get these kind of big things. This is commonplace that when you get large defects and you don't want to do anything to cut out the knee, you can do cartilage reconstruction. And when your cellular repair capability is fine, you can do abrasion and microfracture, or you can add the cells and you can do the ACI or assisted mosaic plasties, etc. And the father of all this about 25, 30 years was uh, Mats Britberg. You can also save the meniscus, not suture the meniscus, but now you've got scaffolds which you can insert inside the joint, fix them up over there, and over time, this gets integrated to reform the meniscus which has been partly removed also. So folks, this may be the future. Because if you look at it, the global market for orthobiologics this year is 5.5 billion, which is not a small figure. But before I go, we must under some, understand some key points. 
we must understand that we are using our own cells to stimulate our own joints. And to ensure safety, you have to have proper collection methods because medical legal cases, things have not been addressed. So where do we stand? There are some things which we properly don't know about osteoarthritis, especially the etiopenogenesis and the factors controlling progression. But we do know that biological therapy works. It works through various factors. It influences multiple processes inside the joint. How each one is influenced, we still don't know. But remember, look at this foot ulcer. It heals. So the power of healing lies within us. We just have to use it correctly. Therefore, joint preservation in appropriate case could be a viable option, more so in the future. And I think that's where the future of surgery lies. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Manoj. Uh, thank you, Dhiraj. Uh, my, my talk of, the, of today is uh, approach to a stiff knee or ankylosed knee. Now, all these cases of stiff knee or ankylosed knees are quite tough. Uh, in exposure, and the main issue is in the exposure. So I'll try to deal with the exposure, how we can make it easy. All the knees which have the range of motion less than 50 degrees uh, may be called the stiff or ankylosed knees. It could be a fibrous ankylosis, it could be a bony ankylosis, and if it is bony, then you have to decide whether it's a spontaneous fusion or it's a surgical fusion. And it is also important to know whether the ankylosis is in the flexion or in extension because mostly the, the ankylosis in extension is far more difficult to deal with. The exposure options are the quadriceps snip that we all know, uh, banana peel, table tubercle osteotomy, and vivaplasty. Out of this, vivaplasty is hardly ever used. Um, I'll, I'll go to the uh, banana peel uh, discussion first. Uh, this is a simple way. You have to make a very sharp subperiosteal uh, a dissection. It is preferably to be done in the younger patients where you have a better surrounding soft tissues. And then carefully you can peel it off as much as we do in the elbow replacement. As on the similar lines you can do it and then it will fall back in its line. The other option is tibial tubercle osteotomy uh, which, is, which, is a, which gives a certain advantages like what you see here, this patient who has a uh, Fused knee. Uh, this patient had a had a big uh, scar on the anteromedial aspect, and because he had a scar on the anteromedial aspect, obviously we had to take a anterolateral approach. So in this patient, we had taken an anterolateral approach, and uh, tibial tubercle osteotomy can be done both in the lateral as well as medial approach in an easy way. Uh, the the care has to be that it has to be at least. Uh, uh, seven to eight centimeter uh, a large tibial tubercle chunk. Uh, it is not necessary that you make a full uh, longer incision, maybe a shorter incision is okay. And then take one or two or three osteotomes and keep uh, uh, hammering them slowly. And it should be tried that the opposite side of the, of the periosteum remains intact. You can put the bone lever and try to raise it up uh, gently. Uh, make more dissection with the with the osteotome, and because this particular patient was a was a fused knee, uh, so you have to do the uh, osteotomy at the uh, patellofemoral joint, and then you can use again the one or two osteotomes and just open it up, and gradually when you keep opening it up, this this will keep keep opening on its uh, on its own. and then you can make it more further sharper dissection. And because the knee is stiff, you may make a wedge osteotomy first. And mostly in these patients, the ACL remains intact. And even if it's a fused knee, you will see that ACL is still, is still visible. And then the good approach is that you can, you can make a, uh, uh, use the osteotomes, and then you, by the manual pressure, you can keep trying to open it up. 
can use the uh, straight osteotome, then you can use the curved osteotome, and then after, uh, by the, by the, you can take the knee at the edge of the bed, and you can keep pushing it up so that the space is opening up now. And by the, by the gentle upwards, taking care that you don't fracture the femur, because the fracture femur could be, um, in this case, uh, as I'm putting the mark with the, uh, with the scale, then you can go ahead with the, uh, with the, with the T-bill cut. And see that the bill cut is, is correct, the alignment is okay. Go to the femoral cut. And lot of it will be, in such cases, will be the eyeballing. And you see that the extension uh, gap is maintained. The alignment is correct. And then you will see that posteriorly, there are, there are still the osteophytes because there will be a bony formation posteriorly also. By the use of the curved osteotome, you keep opening it up and then the joint will slowly and gradually will open up very well. And you can keep removing those bony pieces. You can use the, uh, the uh, ronger or uh, bone nibbler. And then, you can see that the gradually you will delineate very well and you will be able to have a reasonable good space in flexion and extension. The problem in these patients is that stability is not as much of a problem because the stiffness itself gives reasonable stability and usually you are able to gain the movements of our 60 to 90 degrees what do you see this patient? So the exposure itself is, is, the, is the only biggest, uh, biggest trouble in these cases. And the uh, uh, rest of the surgery is, is far more simpler. So these are the simple methods to do the uh, exposure. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you. So you, okay. So uh, our next uh, is Vivek. Vivek, can we have you here? Vivek is going to talk about the sequence of release in fixed flexion depo deformity. You got a video, Vivek? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chairpersons. Uh, well, uh, I'll talk about the sequence of releases for uh, treatment of fixed flexion deformity with uh, uh, TKA. Uh, the sequence is the first step is the most common one, medial lateral release and tibial osteophyte removal, followed by femoral posterior osteophyte removal and posterior recess clearance. If that doesn't help, you can move to femoral posterior capsule and soft tissue release. If still doesn't help, then you can take additional distal femoral resection. If that still doesn't help, then tibial posterior capsule release and hamstring tenotomy or iliotibial band release in that order. With experience, we have seen that if we reduce our threshold for hamstring tenotomy, then it is possible to avoid additional distal femoral resection in many, many cases, mainly the cases which have very, very soft bones, rheumatoid bones, where cutting more additional bone uh, would be a daunting uh, task for the patient. So uh, to start with the video, There's a patient who has severe flexion deformity so much that the patient has to uh, crawl on the ground. It's uh, acute on one side and the patient crawls like this. These are the preoperative x-rays. So for demonstration only the uh, left side is being shown. So the first step is medial lateral release which is standard uh, subperiosteal release staying strictly on the bone with a curved cautery so as to avoid damaging the uh, collaterals and the uh, removal of tibial osteophytes whether they are on the medial or lateral side will depend on the merit of the case. Step 2 is the femoral posterior osteophyte removal can be removed with the curved osteotome uh, very safely. If that doesn't solve the problem, if it is a moderate to severe case then one can uh, 
Proceed to femoral posterior capsule and soft tissue release. Again, curving the cautery tip towards the bone is a good tip so that it doesn't uh, cut through the capsule and you remain strictly on the bone. Retract the posterior capsule with a curved osteotome and you can go way up to few centimeters behind the posterior uh, margin of the posterior condyle and then uh, erase the rest of it depending upon the merit of the case, uh, keeping a uh, uh, a mop between the osteotome and the capsule so that you don't damage any vital structures. If that still doesn't help, you can take additional distal femoral resection. In very severe cases, you can take primarily a, a bigger cut up to the level of collaterals. Take care that you don't violate the collaterals. Up to 12-13 millimeters of the cut can also be taken. If you have not already taken additional, you can add on at a later stage as well. But please save the collaterals. If that still doesn't help, in very severe acute contractures, one can release the posterior capsule from the tibia as well. It is a less required step, but at times it is very, very helpful. We can erase almost the whole posterior capsule from the tibia, keeping the cautery tip curved and retracting with a curved osteotome, even posterior laterally, as long as you are staying on the bone, it's pretty much safe. We can insinuate a finger up to the posterior lateral cortex to see if everything is clear. If that still doesn't help, hamstring tenotomy is a valuable tool which can be done primarily in very severe cases, even before you start the surgery, even before you make the skin incision, if you're anticipating it. You feel for the hamstrings, move the knee a little bit, dissect uh, along the direction of the hamstrings. Take care to deliver the hamstrings clearly so that you see everything very clear that you are the cutting cutting the tendon and not everything else and it should be cut slowly uh, with a the, with a small knife after one tendon has been cut you should put the finger to feel for other tight structures and uh, trust me cutting the whole of the hamstrings will also not cause functional impairment in such cases as we will come to it later in the video demonstration if you find any blood vessels there do take care to coagulate them once you have done with the hamstring in very severe acute flexion deformities the posterior half of the iliotibial band can also be erased we should put a gauze piece on the inner side of the iliotibial band to avoid damaging anything feel with the finger and we can insinuate a small dissecting scissor and uh, section the uh, at least the posterior half of the iliotibial band be happy with the partial correction at the end of the surgery in such cases once you have done all the releases especially the hamstring stenotomy the post-operative rehabilitation becomes fairly easy without application of any amount of force it will spontaneously correct in few days time you see near full correction and good hamstring function good quadriceps function early mobilization you see this is the fifth day, patient is flexing as well and near full correction without application of force, no neurovascular damage because we have accepted partial correction on the table after doing all releases, post-operative rehabilitation becomes fairly quick. This is at the end of five days, patient is even able to lock the knee with the, with the quads at the end of six weeks. Good quads function. So the, the message is that we should lower our threshold for hamstring tenotomy. We may be able to avoid uh, a more permanently long-lasting damaging step, which is the additional distal femoral resection, especially for very soft bones. We have tried out in a couple of cases. More to go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vivek. That was nice. Uh, now we have uh, Dr. Mrinal Sharma. Uh, he will show us patellar re resurfacing tips and pulse. Afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Manush, for giving me this opportunity. Um, I don't know how many of you do patella resurfacing here, but if in due course of your practice you start doing that, or if you're doing that, you must take care of these, uh, you know, little bit uh, small tips. Which I need the volume for this video. Can we have that volume for the video, please? Oh, so it's not running. Okay. So you word the patella. You hold it with cockles and uh, try and remove all the osteophytes. Once you've removed all the osteophytes from around, do a circumcision. You remove the tissues around the patella. Make sure to remove the tissues on the superior pole because if you don't do that, sometimes the synovium can hypertrophy and cause the patella clunk. 
So that can be a cause of pain in the post-operative period for which you might need to intervene with the arthroscopy. Better do it now, remove that part. Measure the thickness of patella. Here you can see it is almost 24 mm. You use the resection guide and with the uh, help of a C guide, just see that you're cutting the patella all around and it's equal. It is very important, you know, patella, when you're cutting this, this is an anatomical patella of a tuned knee, which I'm uh, doing here. I'm cutting 9.5 mm. So from a 24 mm thickness, I'm cutting 9.5 mm. Make sure you do not cut more than uh, needed and you don't overstuff by cutting less. So it is very important that the desired thickness of patella needs to be cut. You cut it from the superior and the inferior poles, both sides, and then measure the thickness both in the superior and the inferior poles because this resection is very important. This is called the patellar resection angle, which actually I'll show you in my study later that it can be a cause of anterior knee pain. So once you use that jig for drilling the holes, make sure that it is seating well in the groove. That is very important with this kind of anatomical patella with the tune because it is domed and it is anatomical. If you rotate it, put it in a rotated way, it's going to track in a bad way and it is going to be a cause of pain. Mark the drill holes and try and uh, drill these in a reverse manner so that you can compress the bone there. Do the trial reduction, make sure the patella is tracking well. Once you've done that, you need to go back and you know, just see if it's not tracking well, you can do a little bit of lateral release if possible. Remove all the residual osteophytes once your uh, patella button is seating well and remove the cartilage, residual cartilage if it is there. You wash the patella with pulse lavage, make sure you clean it dry and then comes the cementing. Once you're cementing, you need to put in the cement into the holes and make sure you mark those holes because a lot of times they get lost and you don't, you tend to pressurize the patella dome in the wrong way and it doesn't seat in a proper position. That's very important. Once you've done that, pressurize it with the pressurizer which is available, hold it, don't move it and ultimately, then once you pressurize, remove all the cement around Make sure there's no cement hanging over on which can cause a problem or can be a cause of knee pain later on. After the cement has been removed, you can again check for the patella tracking. You see there is no overhang of patella either on the superior or inferior borders or medial laterally. That's very important. There the patella dome button should not be overhanging. Again, check for the tracking. And once you've done that, make sure that it is sitting well in the groove and it's tracking and you can check it after the closure also. A lot of people do the two stitch test, the no thumb technique, you can use any of those. And the patella should be seating in a proper position. And that's uh, very important. If your patella is not tracking well, it is going to be cause of anterior knee pain. So this is the same patient post-op x-rays, sorry for the clips, but the, you can see the 45 degree skyline views that it is seating well in the groove. Now in one of these cases, bilateral patella replacement I've done, you can see the tilt of the patella on the left side is little more then on the right side. So that actually is determined by the patella resection angle. So that is very important that you cut the patella equally in all the superior and inferior poles and medial laterally, because if you see on this side, the patella is not tracking pretty well. And also avoid putting a patella in an overhanging position like this in this case. So if you want to know more about uh, anterior knee pain, you can read my article published in Journal of Arthroplasty in May 2019 this year. It's about the role of anatomical patella on anterior knee pain. So what I did the study with Dr. Anavat and found out that the patellar resection angle is the major cause of anterior knee pain. If the resection angle is high, you can have anterior knee pain. We did not find any correlation between patellar tilt, patellar thickness, stuffing and displacement with the anterior knee pain in our study. But it has been correlated in, a, in literature, okay? So make sure if you do it, you replace the patella, do it well, do it fine, and the way I've told you. Thank you. Excellent and uh, well in time. So I think we have only one more talk left, which is uh, Mr. Chetan Mr. Sooth, Dr. Chetan Sooth, uh, gap balancing and uh, flexion gap first technique. We have two dropouts here, I think, uh, Dr. Heman Sharma and Dr. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank the organizers for the opportunity and uh, I'm talking about the gap balancing technique and uh, essentially a lot of us do measure resection and gap balancing, but this thing is specifically about when we balance the extension gap to the flexion gap. Uh, these are my credentials and disclosures. So this is the uh, lady, she was like 14, 59, but looked like 70 and ejection fraction 45%. So that's one of the reasons that I went for uh, uh, this thing because the intramedullary 
instrumentation this is pretty less compared to other instrumentation though there is a little bit of it so the start with the video the important part of the gap balancing is that you need to mobilize and correct the deformity what it was a fixed uh, flexure it was a fixed virus so you need to mobilize and f entirely get the thing right and the tibial cut is the most important cut so as you see uh, during the video i'll verify the tibial cut at every step so this is the one which is because we are going to build up from the tibia upwards so if you get this cut wrong everything goes wrong and if you do not uh, release do the releases initially so you will not so that's why we are more meticulous about doing all the osteophytes doing all the medial releases prior to doing any of the cuts and which may be different in measured section as you see i'm verifying the tibial cut again and if there's a requirement you can next thing is to just take out the osteophytes from the femoral side because these tends and as it's a completely and a purely gap balancing technique there should be no osteophytes before you go on to the next cut that's the sizing of the femur this sizing is the ap sizing but in this system there is no medial lateral sizing you have to kind of eyeball that part and that will show you that in this case i sized it to size 3 but it looked a little bit more broader so you need to do the undersizing downsizing or upsizing now if you take the cut then 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 the whole game is over so downsize now if required it was required i downsized to size 2 and once you have decided the thing now we are going to now take an extra medullary technique which also ensures the adequate flexion of the knee implant if it's intramedullary there's always a tendency for extension there's an extra medullary technique of uh, getting the alignment and uh, putting the ap jig so a little bit of intramedullary instrumentation it's a very short rod about 8 inches only and as you can see we align this with all you have to do is take an instrument in turn put a intramedullary rod and this as you will as i will demonstrate what we are trying to do is to get a posterior femoral cut and get an extension flexion gap so this should be absolutely free and the flexion gap is going to be completely based on the tibial cut so as i am emphasizing again if the tibial cut is not good everything is not good i'll verify it again and once i'm happy with this i pin it here and this is the position on the this is the rotation of the femur so if you are tight on the medial side you will get a internally rotated femur if you are loose you will get external rotated femur so do not disregard the white size line and the transepicondyle axis these small rods on the sides are very important keep an eye on them all the time now that's the rotation of the femur which is now actually a reference from the tibial cut the cut uh, these are the ap cuts this uh, this jigs give you the um, um, you know the rotation of the femur and also the size the exact size that you want to do once you are you want to do these cuts you go on to the anterior cut and then go down to the posterior cut and this is the posterior cut is the time that you get the flexion gap as you can see it's a very big flexion gap it's quite a deformed knee um you need to do entire clearance now posteriorly because we are going for the extension and we are going to balance the extension gap to the flexion gap so if you you cannot do the posterior clearance later on this is the time you have to do the clearance so that you can next go on to the extension cup i hope i make it myself clear so once you are happy with the extension you see uh, what the flexion gap is if the flexion gap measured this was about 5 mm as per the thing we verify the alignment again and now if i am happy with it i proceed on and go on to uh, now determine the extension cut then again the same rod goes back but just now this time it goes all the way flush and fixes the extension uh, cutting jig uh, onto the anterior femur uh, as you see we have determined the flexion gap and now what we are doing is we are going to determine the uh, and balance the extension gap to the existing flexion gap so it's a progressive thing you know it, you can't go step back and correct it so you have to keep progressing in the surgery in a step wise and a uh, fashion that's the crux of the uh, this surgery as you see that uh, uh, we have pinned it i'm happy take this out make an extension cut but as the as i said again it may be a very big cut and you need to verify you may be actually cutting the collateral so don't blindly go with the instrumentation make sure you're not cutting the collaterals here and the exact size that we had a flexion cup we balance this to the extension if you are happy we can move the jig uh, proximally and distally uh, if required and if that is happy if you are happy with the extension balance which is now equivalent to the flexion balance you again verify the alignment with the femur the tibial alignment you are already done now you can't change that but you want to align it with the femur if you are happy you can progress with the uh, rest of the surgery and uh, just uh, i think about another 10 seconds uh, 
this is the extension cut which takes place. And uh, I'll just go on to the implant preparation. This has got a very bone conserving uh, preparation in which the chamfers are also uh, very bone conserving. That's another reason I went for this because she had already got a lot of bone loss. And uh, the notch cut is also very small in which you actually punch the bone inside. The chamfer is taken there and uh, once the chamfers are there, you do the tibial preparation. There was a big bone defect which I'll address with the screw later on because it was less than five millimeter at the end. And that's how you do the trialing. If you're happy with the trialing, and you get a very well balanced knee. So that's the technique about extension gap, uh, uh, the flexion gap first technique in which you balance the extension to the flexion gap and not the other wise which we are used to. So I think that's the end of the surgery. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Suth, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So the, the only message that I'd like to say is that pretty much clear is that uh, it is the tibial cut which is the most important cut. So please be careful. If you're going with the surgery, the tibial cut is the important cut. We build up from the tibial cut upwards. All the releases, whether it's a varus knee or a valgus knee you do, you need to do the releases, take out the osteophytes prior to the balancing. Once you do that, you don't go back. As you see in this x-ray, I've left a little bit of osteophyte, so I'm not going to remove it, you know. And if the posterior clearance is done before taking the extension gap, uh, which we balance to the uh, flexion gap. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, two questions. One, uh, uh, you do all the surgeries with this technique? No, no, no. Uh, see, in my center, we use something close to five or six systems. So, uh, so why, uh, why, uh, I mean, what gives you the pleasure of using this system more than the others, yeah, if you want to? Yeah, so. What uh, makes you choose? Yeah, what we do is, uh, uh, most of the systems that we use, in this case, I particularly choose this one, is uh, the, this system also has a system I can use a stem if it was required, an augment, that is one call for it. Secondly, it was a uh, very large defect was there. So I could have used any of the things. It, this system has a build-up, the one we have with us, has a build-up for augments, stems, as well as up to a constraint implant rest. And if you see, the, it has a deep dish cut design, which is a rotating platform. So I chose that for this. Yes, okay, which is there others. One more thing, uh, if you go ahead and you see that you are cutting the collaterals in order to balance, then what do you do? That is the time, so uh, you already determined the flexion gap. Now what you have to do is then, then you have to downsize the thing. So we have to, that's why I took this one. We have the augments. Now you can augment the thing and then you reduce the extension gap. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sharma, one question. I think you escaped. Uh, if there is any question, I'm asking questions, that's why. Uh, one question. Uh, so if you have a, uh, for the sake of all of us, if you have a knee in uh, uh, flexion which is fixed, not what Vivek showed, he showed something different. If it is fixed in flexion, what is the approach you use usually at that time? How do you open up the knee? If it is f fixed in flexion, say 30 degree flexion deformity. Ankylosed, and ankylosed and, 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 and in the flexion. Knees ankylosed. These, this knee will be far more easier than a knee which is fixed in extension, zero degree or five degree. Uh, the biggest trouble in these patients will be the exposure and the larger flexion gap. And to take care of the larger flexion gap, one may choose the, posteriorize the femoral component, and maybe you can choose one size larger femoral component. And most of these cases, you have to go little uh, more distal femoral cut. But oh. I prefer that uh, we do not cut more than four millimeter additional maximum limit, and a lot of release posteriorly, okay. especially the posterior osteophytes and posterior capsule. Okay. A lot of questions, but we can talk later on. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, everyone, for that uh, talk.